to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Bereans searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Acts chapter 17, verse number 11. We welcome you today to our study of Acts chapter 17 through 19 as we're thinking about the exciting and powerful book, of Acts. We're so glad that you joined us for our study together today, and we want you to take just a moment, if you don't have it already, we want you to take just a moment to locate your own copy of the Bible, have it out and ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast, and uh, we want to make sure that you check out the Lord's Church in your area. Today's broadcast is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ in your area. The church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit with them. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about these people, how they worship, what they teach, you'll find people at the Lord's Church who would be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. You'll find kind, friendly people there who'd be glad to visit with you on those matters. And so we hope that you'll visit the Church of Christ in your area. If you're already looking for a place to, to worship or learn more about God, be sure and check out the Lord's Church. They'd be glad that you did. Friend, also at the Gospel of Christ. We'd love to help you in your desire to know more about God and His will as well. Please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material online. We offer digital audio copies of all our lessons, as well as uh, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, things of that nature. If you'd like to have a copy of today's study on the book of Acts, we can send you, you can go to our website, fill out our free media request form. We can send you a digital copy of that, or if you'd like to have a DVD, we can send you that as well. And so please check us out. We've got good studies on every book of the Old Testament, every book of the New Testament, and a wide variety of good topical studies. And so we want to encourage, encourage you to check out our website. Also, don't forget about the Gospel of Christ app and our Facebook page. Great ways to keep up with what we're doing. Uh, in our fast-paced world, you can download our app from the respective play stores. And, of course, check us out on Facebook. Like us and follow us. And that would be a great way to keep up with what we're doing as well. We're now turning our attention in our study of the book of Acts to the latter half of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17 through 19 is what we're thinking about today. We're in that section where the gospel is now going to the uttermost parts of the world, places that have never heard about Jesus. Through the Apostle Paul and the spreading of the gospel with his workers are now hearing about Christ and his salvation. In Acts chapter 17, we're now in the area of Corinth and Thessalonica, places like unto that, uh, Corinth, Ephesus, Thessalonica, and those areas will be where we're at today. In Acts chapter 17 specifically, we're in the region of Thessalonica. And Paul, as his custom was, Paul would go into an area, like in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 4, he would go into an area and he would find people who believed in God, if possible, and he would go into the Sabbath and he would, in this, into the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he'd preach Jesus to them. And he does just that. And the Bible says he reasoned with them from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. And so some believed that, and they began to follow that message. But that brought persecution to some people in the area of Thessalonica. Look at what happened when some obeyed the gospel in Acts chapter 17. Look in verses 5 and 6. 
But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming jealous or envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these men who turned the world upside down have come here too. And so persecution came. To some, Jason and his household, and no doubt Paul and his followers as well, rushed out of the city because of that. But friend, there's a, a pretty practical lesson that we can learn from this as it relates to those who follow Jesus and who try to spread the message of God's love. From time to time, persecutions will come to followers of Christ. It ought not to surprise us when that happens because the Bible tells us that it's going to. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul said in Acts 14 verse 22, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. There's going to be problems. There's going to be jealous people. There are going to be those who oppose the message of Christianity. Suffering, persecution, and trouble might come because of that. But friend, if Jesus could endure what he endured for me, surely, knowing ahead of time that it's going to come, I can face that persecution for the greatest cause in all the world. But isn't it interesting what these unbelievers what these people who are jealous of Paul and Jason say about Christians. Those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Did you know they actually got that backwards? Paul and Jason and Silas and, and those who are teaching the gospel, they're not turning the world upside down. They're turning the world that's upside down already right side up. You see, Christianity puts the world where it ought to be. The world's already upside down because of sin. The world is already upside down because following the world's moral standard is backwards. Following man's plan of salvation is backward. Man's ideology is upside down. Paul and Barnabas and Jason are actually turning the world right side up because only God's way is the right way. When we teach the gospel, when we preach God's moral standard and God's plan, we're not, we're not doing harm to the world. We're actually doing good. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We're to be an example to the world, and that's what Christians are trying to do. Matthew 5, 16, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12. Now, unlike in the area of Thessalonica, where people pretty much run Paul out of town, at least some of them did, Paul receives a little better reception in Berea. Look at what's said about the Bereans, and here's a, such a powerful lesson to learn. Acts chapter 17, look if you would in verse number 11. In Berea it is said, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. When I hear about the Bereans, I'm, I'm encouraged because while persecution may come, you also find people who really want to know more about God. Think about what happened with the Bereans. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. What's that mean? Imagine Paul knocks on the door at the house in Berea. He's already been run out of town in Thessalonica. He knocks on the first door he gets to in Berea, and what happens? Do they recognize it's Paul? Slam the door in his face and call the police? No. They received the word with all readiness. They said, Paul said, I'm here to tell you I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. And they didn't shut the door in his face. They said, Paul, come on in. We'd like to hear about it. Paul comes in. He sits down at the table with these folks. And he begins to unfold from the scriptures, pointing out every prophecy, every passage that Jesus has fulfilled, leading these people right up to the point where they can see for themselves in the Bible, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And so what did they do next? Automatically accept what Paul said, hook, line, and sinker? No. They said, Paul, 
We're glad you came today. We, we've enjoyed hearing what you had to say. We've taken notes on that. And now we're going to check it. They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Friend, we need more people who've got the heart and the mindset of the Bereans. It never, it ought never to offend anyone when people say, where is that at in the Bible? For the Bible says in Jeremiah 37, 17, is there any word from the Lord? The Bible asks in Romans 4, verse 3, what does the scripture say? And so to hear somebody say, what does the Bible say about that? What does God say? Where is that found in the Bible? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We want people who will hear the message of God, get out their own copy of the Bible, and study to show themselves approved unto God, who will prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 2 Timothy 2.15, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. And so we want to be ready always to give an answer, and we want people to check that in their own copy of the Bible to see that what they're being told is true to the will of God. Now, in Acts chapter 17, there is also a pretty a graphic, pretty memorable scene about the idolatrous people in this area. Acts 17, verse 16, as Paul goes to the region of Athens and a little further on his missionary journey, he will run into idolatry and false religion. And as he goes into Athens and he goes up on the Mars Hill, the Areopagus, the Bible says Paul's spirit is turned within him when he sees all the people given over to idolatry. And friend, when we see all the wrong that's in our world, when we see all the wrong ideologies, wrong systems of belief, how people are caught up so much in, in worldliness and ungodliness, that'll move us spiritually inside to do something. And thus Paul looks for an opportunity to preach to these people about Jesus. Let's look at what Paul said. Look at Acts chapter 17, and I want you to see what Paul says to the people on Mars Hill. Look at Acts 17, verse number 22. The Bible says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he need anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he's made from one nation, one blood, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our very being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God once overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he's ordained, and he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And so in Acts 17, Paul stands before these idolaters filled with idolatry, more idols than you could ever imagine, even so bad that there is actually, okay, here's the way it actually is. Let's say you came to Athens and you were from a region nobody had ever heard of. In Athens, on their idolatrous hill, Mars Hill, they actually had an adopted idol, meaning this, if you came and we don't have one of your idols here, this idol to the unknown God, you can adopt it for the week and use it as your idol. Now, friend, you talk about an idolatrous people. So bad they've got an adopt an idol in case your idol's not represented. That's how bad it was on Mars Hill in Athens. And Paul is moved and he stands up and says, let me tell you about this unknown God. He created all men. 
He made from one blood every nation. Everything we do is in his hands. Your own poets have said we're his offspring, and here's how you can know that's the case. Let me give you the proof. He sent his son, raised him from the dead, and he now commands all men everywhere to repent. The resurrection of Jesus, which no doubt spread like wildfire through that whole area, was proof that God now commands all men everywhere, that he is God, and that he commands all men everywhere to repent. God once overlooked times of ignorance like this, but not anymore. Men are given, given account for their thinking. And so the resurrection, the proofs we find in the Bible, the evidence from prophecy, the evidence of scripture that lines up perfectly in every case with history. Friend, you cannot ignore the evidence. When you look at the evidence, that causes us to do something, to turn from a life of sin and a life of idolatry and turn to God. Like in Acts chapter 18 that we're now moving to, Acts chapter 18, Paul now goes into the area of Corinth and he preaches the gospel to them. There's this sorcerer there named Elamist. He tries to oppose Paul. He's struck blind because of that. Paul preaches the gospel and because of those great miracles, what he says, the signs that back that up. The Bible says in Acts chapter 18 verse 8, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Isn't that amazing? Just like we find in every account when we look to the book of Acts and put all of it together, people had to hear words to be saved. Acts 11 verse 14. People are told, believe on the Lord Jesus, you and your household, and you will be saved. Acts 16 verse 24 through 30. And people had to be baptized to get into Christ. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 18.8 is kind of the gospel plan of salvation in a nutshell. They were told what to do, and they did that, and they obeyed God and became Christians. And friend, when we do that, when we do what people did in the book of Acts, that's how we become Christians today, just like they were then. Now let's turn our attention as we continue in Acts chapter 18 we're now thinking about a, a well-intentioned man, a good man, a well-intentioned man, a very uh, eloquent man who just needed a little help learning what to do to be saved. Look at the great man Apollos in Acts 18. I want you to look in verse 24 following. The Bible says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. We desire to cross Achaia, the brethren wrote, and they're going to encourage him there. But look at what happens with Apollos and what happens with Priscilla and Aquila. Here's Apollos, eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures. He's, he knows about Jesus. He's preaching him in the synagogue, but he doesn't know the rest of the story. All he knows is the baptism of John, and he's not been caught up on the baptism of Christ and people coming into the kingdom and things like that. And so what did Priscilla and Aquila do? Did they, did, did they get mad at him? Did they call him names? Did they take their Bible and hit him over the head? None, none of that. They heard error being taught or something that wasn't correct anymore. And they take Apollos and they pull him aside. And they begin to explain the process of what happened more to him. They, they no doubt started the baptism of John. And they tell about what Jesus did more and what happened. They would recount what went on in Acts chapter 2 and how John's baptism was a, a preparatory baptism and how that uh, Jesus fulfilled all the law and now men and women can be baptized for the mission of their sins, not according to John's baptism, but into Jesus Christ, the, the one who was sent from God to save people from their sin. And so there was indeed a baptism of repentance that John put forth, but that was preparing people for the way of the Lord. 
Uh, was it authorized and commanded by God? Sure it was. Matthew 21, verse 25 clearly teaches that, but it was to prepare for Christ's coming. It was a baptism for the forgiveness of sins, Luke 3, verse 3, but it was not the permanent and final baptism. Luke 3, verse 16, there's one coming after me whose shoes John said I'm not worthy to tie. He's the one you need to follow. It's his baptism that you'll need to listen to. And so Apollos was teaching error. But you know what's good about two people in this context? About Apollos, he was, he was a fervent man, an eloquent man, minding the scriptures, but he was also teachable. When they pulled him aside and he learned the, more about God's plan and saw the truth, he accepted that and started teaching truth. As it relates to Apollos or Priscilla and Aquila, they had the love for Apollos to go to him personally, to pull him aside, to, 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 to show him more of what the scripture said in love, and both parties did what they should have, and as a result, God's cause and God's kingdom goes forth and does so much good throughout that area and throughout that region. Now, we're in the area of Ephesus, and I want you to know what happens in Acts chapter 19. It's an interesting scene. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 19. Paul is at Ephesus, and look at Acts chapter 19, verse number 9. The Bible says, But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the synagogue. And so Paul is in Ephesus. He's reasoning with these people. He's teaching them about God. And they hear about the way, and some people obey that, and some people don't. You see, Christianity is God's way today. There are only two ways. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, broad way, easy way leads to destruction. Narrow way, restricted way leads to eternal life. And Paul preaches to them about the way. Jesus is the way, John 14, 6, the truth and the life. He is the way of salvation. No man comes to God except by me, Jesus would say. He is the only way to a good life. John 10, verse 10, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And his way leads to happiness. But some people didn't want to hear about that. As a result, Paul had to go to other areas. And so in the midst of Ephesus, though, an evil city, and if you study about Ephesus, Ephesus was filled with immorality. Like Athens, it was filled with idolatry, uh, filled with people who worshipped uh, other gods in very immoral and licentious ways, sexual ways, and it was a wicked city. And yet, in the midst of this evil city, the church is established. Paul preaches the gospel. So much, it's so powerful that, that people actually who hear that message and realize it's true, they bring their magic books and they sell those, and the gospel has its start among this city. I want you to look in verse 18 following. The Bible says, as the gospel comes to Ephesus, many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who practiced magic brought their books together, burned them in the sight of all. They counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Did it hurt when some people obeyed the gospel financially? They burned their magic books, probably cost them their, their livelihood and immorality and in false religion, but was it worth it? Sure, you buy the truth. And friend, there's no price you can put on that. Proverbs 23, verse 23. And so here's what I want you to consider. In an evil city like Ephesus, and, and you think of whatever, whatever city you might think of that is filled with immorality and ungodliness. I would think of places like Las Vegas. You know, you go down Fremont Street in Las Vegas and you can see things that you just can't imagine. Immorality, ungodliness, all kind of false worship and, and, and things that are just morally heinous. Even in places like Ephesus, the gospel took hold and it did good and the church grew and people were saved and God and Jesus Christ were glorified. How do we know that? Look at, Acts, look at the commentary in Acts chapter 19, verse number 20. The Bible says in the midst of this evil city, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. 
Friend, when the gospel is preached, it, it, it's such a powerful message, it's such a relatable message, it's such a, a true message that when that message is preached about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, what God says men and women have to do to be saved and how to live a good, pure, wholesome life that brings happiness and joy, when that message is preached, it's naturally going to have an effect. Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 11, God says, My word shall not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which I've sent it. God's word has power, and that power changes lives and changes people's hearts. Romans 1, verse 16 to 17, James chapter 1, verse number 21. And so, my friend, we ask you today, are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel? Maybe your life has been lived in, in immorality. Maybe your life's been living wickedness. Maybe you're not a bad person, but you've never really given your life to Jesus. Friend, we want to encourage you to do that today. Do what people did in the book of Acts to become Christians, and you'll be a Christian just like they were. What did they do? They heard the message about Jesus. Their hearts were open to that message. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 23 once they heard that message, they believed it with all their heart. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 37. Once they believed that message, they turned from a life of sin. Acts 3.19, repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. They confessed Jesus is Christ. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And friend, to get in Christ and to have every sin washed away. Here's what Ananias told Saul of Tarsus. Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, verse 16, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And so if you've never obeyed the gospel, we urge you to do that. If maybe you would like to know more about God's plan of salvation, how to become a Christian, contact the local church of Christ in your area. Contact us. We'll be glad to help you. And we hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the book of Acts. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.